Welcome everybody to uh, our, um, I guess, ad hoc, I think is the, is the terminology we use in the center, our ad hoc seminar um, today with, uh, with Dr. Christopher Sears, who I'll introduce um, briefly, um, uh, uh, introduce in a moment, I suppose it would, would be properly. I mean, it might be a very fulsome introduction. Who knows? I have not quite got that far, so yeah. Um, I just uh, wanted to, just to say, um, just a, a little bit uh, uh, about the centre, the Welcome Centre, because I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how familiar everybody here will be with the, with the Welcome Centre for Cultures and Environments of Health, um, who are, uh, we are running this seminar today in collaboration with um, the Centre for Medical History here at the University of Exeter. Um, and uh, the Welcome Centre is a, is a Welcome Trust funded uh, interdisciplinary research centre, um, and we are interested in exploring um, uh, ideas of how health, illness and medical knowledge are shaped broadly by uh, cultural practices and beliefs and with placing um, humanities, arts and social science evidence uh, in conversation with, with, with public health initiatives and, and devising sort of innovative and uh, engaged forms of, of research and, uh, and assessment. Um, so uh, before I uh, uh, move on to introduce Chris, I will just do a little bit further self-promoting. I'm going to post a link to the centre in the in the chat and also for our uh, forthcoming events. And please do uh, take a look. It would be wonderful to see you at, uh, at future seminars. Um, and also just to give you a, a quick sense of what the uh, the structure for the, the seminar today. So um, Chris is going to gonna talk for about 45, 40, 45 minutes. Then we'll have a brief um, five minute comfort break. Uh, and when we come back, we have um, uh, a, a wonderful colleague, um, Sue Smith, from our, our uh, I forget the terminology now, I think it's now the Faculty of Life sciences um but please do correct me and i'll introduce sue more fulsomely uh when when she comes back to, to just give some initial reflections and responses and then we'll open up to a broader um discussion for people uh um until and we'll run the seminar until about three o'clock um please do feel free to post comments and questions in the chat as the um as the talk goes along uh, and then as we kind of come back for the discussion or sort of round uh, I'll gather a few of those up and, and maybe invite you to speak to them if you would like to or I'm happy to read them out directly at the time um, uh, if you would prefer to ask a question uh, in, in person as it were then please just use the um, raise your hand uh, function which is under the reactions bu uh, button on the bottom of the toolbar there. Uh, and one other thing is that we have a, a, a brilliant live captioner today, Maria, um, who uh, is going to be providing um, uh, the sort of the captions for the Zoom. So if you again, if you go down to the bottom toolbar, there's a, an options there to click um, show captions, and then you can kind of position that around the, the Zoom call as you would like. Um, OK, so I think that's it. Uh, so it gives me genuine pleasure to uh, to introduce everybody to uh, Dr. Christopher Sears. Uh, Chris is, a, is an historian um, previously of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and currently at the University of Warwick. Um, he has uh, published very widely uh, on histories of uh, health and safety, uh, risk, uh, international health politics and pharmaceutical fakery. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today uh, about the sort of research he's been doing uh, as part of a welcome funded research fellowship uh, on, this, on a project called the Hazardous Hospital. Um, and uh, examining histories of, of safety and, and patient safety in the NHS. So I know we're all uh, much more eager to hear from Chris than from me. So with that, I will end my spiel and I'll hand over to, uh, to Chris to take us on with the talk. So thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Martin, for the very kind introduction. And thanks to everyone at the Welcome Centre and the Centre for Medical History for arranging this webinar. And thanks, everyone, for joining online today as well. So the aim of my seminar today is really to explore the emergence of patient safety in the British National Health Service. Over the last 30 years or so, patient safety has become a major area of policy concern, not only in Britain, not only in the NHS, but in other health systems around the world. As health systems have grown more sophisticated and complex and as technology has become more advanced, greater attention has been paid to the ways in which healthcare can harm patients and how this harm can be avoided. So the research I'm presenting here today stems from my project Hazardous Hospitals, which is funded by the Wellcome Trust and comes to an end this year. 
And this investigates changing values and ideas around patient harm and safety in NHS hospitals from 1948. And at the heart of my project is really this, this key problem or key question, and that is if medicine has long been guided by this ethical injunction to do no harm to patients, how is it that a systemic focus and a systemic language of patient safety has evolved only recently? So given my project's called Hazardous Hospitals, I want to really begin by uh, this seminar by setting my work within the context of the history of hospitals and hopefully making quite a basic point. And that is hospitals have always been hazardous in the sense that they've had the potential to cause harm to patients. So the 17th century German philosopher Gottfried Leibniz once described hospitals as seminarium mortis, which roughly translates as places where the seeds of death are sown. And this image of the medieval or early modern hospital as a, a feared place where the sick and poor essentially went to die or were euphemistically put away, is kind of seared in the minds of many members of the public, you know, regardless or not of its accuracy. And it's an image, so the popular narrative goes, which remains broadly accurate, even for the more relatively more complex institutions of the 19th century. So, for example, the famous Scottish obstetrician, Sir James Simpson, is said to have remarked that patients admitted to hospital were, quote, expo exposed to more chances of death than the English soldier on the field of Waterloo, end quote. So squalid conditions, rampant infection, the delivery of charity, not cure and ineffective, even dangerous treatments for patients in the past, possibly the safest option would have been to remain at home. Now, of course, this is a caricature and it's a really interesting historical question about the relative risks of medicine in the past, especially given it was less effective. So there's this fantastic quote by a renowned pediatrician called Sir Cyril Chandler, who says that medicine used to be simple, ineffective and relatively safe. It is now complex, effective and potentially dangerous. And we could spend all day discussing the historical merits of that quote. But my point here is that this kind of image of the early hospital underpins the kind of cultural perception of the modern <clears throat> hospital as a technologically sophisticated site of healing. With the insights of bacteriology and germ theory, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, hospitals were transformed into cathedrals of medicine, places where more than ever before patients could expect recovery and cure. With sanitary reforms, the introduction of infection control arrangements and more effective therapies and procedures, hospitals became key sites where patients were encouraged to have respect for medical science, but also the expertise and authority of doctors. Let's consider for a moment the incredible advances in medicine over the 20th century. And I'm, I'm conscious here that many of the attendees might not be historians, but the rollout of x-rays, chemical therapies and pharmaceuticals, antibiotics, heart transplants, CT scans, keyhole surgery. The introduction of ever more effective tests, therapies and procedures only reinforced this image of the modern hospital, which was steeped in ideas of scientific progress. To its supporters, the establishment of Britain's National Health Service in 1948 represented the crowning glory of this ideal, the idea that patients could access the latest and most advanced treatments based not on their ability to pay, but on their clinical need, really cemented the hospital in the public imagination as a site of scientific and technological salvation. And indeed, an early criticism of the NHS was that politicians and planners was so fixated on hospitals that it was effectively a national hospital service, not a national health service. The planning and construction of gleaming new district general hospitals in the 60s and 70s, the closure of dilapidated Victorian institutions and heroic depictions of hospital medicine in TV dramas of the time, think things like Emergency Ward 10, only amplified the, the hospital's newfound cultural status. During this period, so in the 60s and 70s, the prestige and influence of hospital medicine was at its peak. The administration of the NHS was led by doctors and medical expertise was highly valued. 
patients in this period were more deferent to doctors, although it would be completely wrong to think that they were unquestioning as histories of patient complaints have shown. However, at a time when ideas of informed consent and patient-centered care had yet to crystallize, and uh, when doctors, especially consultants, wielded enormous power, um, you know, not only did doctors have the power to diagnose and treat as they saw fit with minimal interference, but they alone were deemed capable of determining whether the risk of a particular treatment was, uh, was acceptable for the patient. Yet what might be called the kind of golden age of hospital medicine, if it indeed existed at all, was relatively brief, continuing for perhaps just 20 years following the Second World War. So bed numbers in the NHS reached a peak in 1960 before declining, in part because of a focus on cost effectiveness and the favouring of community care. The public's faith in medicine and medical science soon became tempered by concerns about antimicrobial resistance, hospital acquired infections, and the toxic effects of drugs such as thalidomide. And social critics and academics began to criticize the power and authority of doctors, while patients increasingly exercised their voice as consumers, demanding greater rights, choice, and say in how health services were run. While it never completely disappeared, in recent decades, this idea of the hospital as an intrinsically hazardous space has started to come back with wider awareness of healthcare associated infections and the rise of resistant strains of bacteria such as MRSA, the control of infection has once again become a priority An emphasis is increasingly placed on short lengths of stay in hospitals and swift discharge. As demands on the NHS have grown, the public has become increasingly accustomed to seeing representations on TV or in the radio of service pressure so nowadays in TV documentaries such as BBC's Hospital, you're as likely to see images of ambulances queuing outside hospitals or bed managers trying frantically to find room for a patient uh, just as much as intrepid acts of surgery. Various scandals, meanwhile, have exposed disturbing lapses in safety in various NHS trusts and hospitals. High profile inquiries, most recently around maternity services, have shown that warning signs have been repeatedly missed that the concerns of patients and families have been ignored, and even that serious failures have been suppressed by managements who have been keen to protect their own, their, their hospital's uh, reputations. I think the COVID pandemic most dramatically has exposed the intrinsic hazards of hospital care. And it's worth noting or remembering that during the first wave of the COVID pandemic in England, it's estimated that up to a fifth of symptomatic hospitalized patients caught their infection, not in the community, but in hospital. So elective surgery was canceled, families were denied access to loved ones, and many patients feared being admitted to hospitals as the virus filled beds and shut wards. And the shortage of PPE for staff was also a potent reminder of the many risks healthcare workers face as they go about their daily duties. So over the last 30 years or so, a new way of thinking about patient harm has developed in healthcare. In the 1990s, scientists and researchers gained a new understanding of the extent of harm in healthcare systems. On either side of the Atlantic, major studies and reports drew attention to the sheer numbers of people harmed or killed through healthcare, often because of errors or mistakes in treatment. So in the United States, for example, a report called To Her Is Human highlighted that between 44,000 and 98,000 deaths every single year were linked to errors in US hospitals. And this mortality rate, the report dramatically noted, was higher than that of motor vehicle accidents, AIDS, and even breast cancer. So I think it's fair to say, even among historians, healthcare harm, iatrogenic injury, is not often given the attention it perhaps uh, deserves. In 2000, the Department of Health's report here in Britain, called An Organisation with a Memory, estimated that one in 10 patients admitted to NHS hospitals, or around 850,000 patients a year, experienced an adverse event, a physical or psychological injury resulting from the process of clinical care. This revelation that patient harm was a, a routine feature of the clinical encounter in hospitals 
not a, a rare or peripheral phenomenon that could be put to one side, encouraged a new focus on the prevention and avoidance of harm and subsequently a commitment to patient safety spread throughout the NHS and in other healthcare systems around the world. So the rise of patient safety, I suggest, you know, represents a profound shift in attitudes towards patient harm. Many harms to patients are now thought to be preventable, avoidable, or otherwise manageable through measures put in place by clinicians, managers, regulators, and others. And what I want to do for the remainder of this webinar is to explain how and why such a shift came about. Before I do this, though, it's really worth explaining further what patient safety is, especially for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it. And patient safety has been defined very broadly as the avoidance of unintended or unexpected harm to people during the provision of healthcare. Since the 90s, patient safety has become an important healthcare discipline with a growing body of practical uh, knowledge. And in the NHS, it's become an explicit policy issue and mantra of health service leaders following the publication of this report, an organization with a memory back in, in 2000. Since 2000, patient safety has been reflected throughout the management, regulation and monitoring of the NHS. So for instance, in 2001, the National Patient Safety Agency was formed to provide leadership, information and guidance on patient safety in the NHS. One of its main tasks until it was abolished uh, in 2012, uh, was to oversee a system for reporting and learning from adverse events in the NHS, something which is now overseen by NHS England and NHS Improvement. New independent agencies with responsibility for regulating and inspecting the quality and safety of care have also been established since 2000. So in England, the Care Quality Commission was set up in 2009 to monitor and inspect health and social care providers. And in 2017, the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch was formed and modelled on the way accidents are investigated in aviation. One of its key missions is to investigate patient safety events on a, a technical level without apportioning blame or liability. And I'll, I'll come on to the reasoning behind this later. Alongside these bodies, new organisations have also been formed to represent patients and oversee standards of care in the NHS. And I, I see this as part of the same broad kind of cultural moment. So in particular, Healthwatch England and its network of local health watches champion the interest of patients and monitor the performance of NHS bodies. The NHS constitution commits to patient safety as a basic right of patients, while following the pelvic mesh and sodium valparate scandals, uh, valparate, uh, scandals a, a patient safety commissioner for England has also recently been appointed. At the day-to-day -day level in NHS hospitals, patient safety has become reflected in a variety of systems, processes, and procedures. So there are systems in place for reporting and analyzing incidents. Most recently, the Learn from Patient Safety Event Service, which as we speak has been rolled out across the NHS. Many NHS trusts now have dedicated patient safety managers and specialists whose job is to oversee reporting systems, assist with investigations and implement quality and safety improvement programs. Patient safety alerts are communicated to NHS providers, warning them about important risks that require urgent attention. And since 2000, alerts have been sent on everything on the need to promote hand washing to the dangers of accidental overdose of intravenous potassium or collapsing bed rails to prevent suicide in, in mental health facilities. And the rise of patient safety is also reflected in how checklists and risk assessments and also, have also become a, a kind of much more central feature of clinical life. So, for example, the NHS was an early adopter of the World Health Organization's safer surgery checklist designed to avoid major surgical errors like leaving, uh, uh, leaving an instrument in a patient or operating on the wrong patient. There have been publicity and educational campaigns around various issues such as sepsis, pressure ulcers and, in, and incident reporting. And clinicians also today follow a range of clinical guidelines and protocols which draw upon the latest evidence to ensure that procedures are as safe and effective as they can be. Another recent developments in the NHS also speak to the growth of patient safety as a kind of managerial concern. 
So many NHS trusts now have arrangements to support staff to speak up about incidents, such as the freedom to speak up guardians appointed following a report by Sir Robert Francis in 2015. Some trusts have established mechanisms called Schwartz Rounds, which are monthly meetings to support staff in delivering safe care by allowing them to discuss the emotional and psychological impacts of their work. And as you can imagine, such mechanisms have become very important since COVID. So what I would argue is that through these systems and arrangements, patient safety has become an important managerial function of hospitals, although the record of patient safety has been uneven, as I discuss later. The arrangements for patient safety in the NHS have chopped and changed as various organisations have been created and abolished, and as the NHS has responded to events such as the uh, scandal at Mid Staffordshire. However, I think all these things have one thing in common, and they highlight how patient safety has emerged as a, a collective response to patient harm, something to be managed through good governance, management and regulation. And you can get a glimpse of this if you walk down the corridor of any major hospital. You're likely to come across notice boards, brochures and posters highlighting how safety is managed in the organisation, how to report incidents and what the hospital's governance arrangements are. And this hasn't always been the case. And all this suggests the creation of a new culture in the NHS in which harm to patients began to be seen in a broader way and dis discussed more widely beyond the medical profession, so beyond doctors. Adverse events became a concern for the government, for the media and the wider public, encouraging the adoption of new systems to manage and prevent harm. And patient safety has also become the concern of managers and other professionals, not just doctors. So in the era of patient safety, since the millennium, Safety is seen to be the concern of health systems as a whole, not just the medical profession. And this systemic way of thinking about patient safety is surprisingly recent, as researchers such as Kathleen Sutcliffe and Robert Weirs have shown. So this chart is a, a Google engram, which shows how specific terms in written English have changed in popularity over time. And what you'll see is the term patient safety steadily increased in usage from the 1940s. But when it's a dramatic surge since the 1990s, when these major studies and reports drew attention to clinical error and harm. Since the millennium, more and more issues have been seen in terms of patient safety. Problems that were once considered unavoidable or perhaps somehow part of the everyday landscape of care, such as patient falls or dehydration, are increasingly seen as patient safety problems. And nowadays, the scope of patient safety is so vast that nearly every problem in healthcare can be seen in some way as a patient safety problem. So, for example, you see people increasingly speaking of staff shortages, strikes, waiting times and problems seeing a GP as patient safety problems. Whereas only a few decades ago, they might have been considered more part of the overall standard of care. The scope of patient safety is increasingly expanding on continually expanding and has come to encompass all sorts of harms, not just those resulting from errors or mistakes by doctors. And this naturally leads to the question of how clinicians refer to patient harm before, before patient safety. And indeed, before the 1990s, it was relatively rare for clinicians to speak of patient safety, although it may have been used in a relatively general or shorthand generic way. Clinicians were more likely to speak of complications, medical accidents, mistakes, mishaps, side effects, or uh, a key term uh, which masks all sorts of things, uh, untoward occurrences. But in general, the term patient safety wasn't used and retired clinicians I've spoken to suggest that while clinicians have this common sense notion of patient safety, the actual approach to patient safety in practice was rather casual or as one described, lackadaisical. So this explicit language of patient safety has come hand in hand with the formal approaches to safety I've uh, just mentioned. Clinicians it might be surprised by my assertion that patient safety somehow represents a kind of new moment in the history of medicine and healthcare, because after all, patient safety is supposedly at the heart of medicine. It's at the centre of medical ethics and what it means to be a good doctor. So the fact that medicine could cause harm to patients has indeed been recognised 
for thousands of years. So as, the, as early as the 7th century BC, for example, the ancient Babylonian code of Hammurabi referred to the errors of physicians, arguing that physicians who made mistakes should have their hands amputated. And fortunately, this is not a tradition that has continued. In the 9th century AD, the Islamic physician Al-Rahari used the Greek word pharmakon to refer to medicine, which had ambiguous connotations of both remedy and poison. And for centuries, physicians have been guided by this dictum to do no harm, which has been attributed to the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates. However, what often isn't appreciated is that particular interpretations of this phrase have changed markedly over the ages. So in the 19th century, for example, it was possible for some doctors to justify some rather grisly interventions, such as amputation, on the basis that failing to treat the underlying condition was potentially more harmful. And later in the 20th century, doctors and surgeons could claim exclusive authority to, to determine the risks and benefits of treatment because patients themselves were thought to be too ignorant or unable to make these decisions for themselves. So patient safety, and this is a, an important thing, I think, patient safety developed at a time when patients had more say in their own care and when their wishes and desires were more at the forefront of clinical decision making. And that's that's really the importance of the patient bit in patient safety. Now, doctors could also point to many important figures in the past who helped improve medical technologies and outcomes for patients. They could point to Florence Nightingale's work in recognizing hospital mortality, promoting cleanliness or overhauling standards of nursing. They could point to Joseph Lister and the introduction of antisepsis in surgery or Ignaz Semmelweis's recognition of the link between childbed fever in new mothers and hand hygiene. Now, there are undoubtedly many precedents to our current concern with patient safety, but what I would argue is that all this work by doctors and nurses in the past, often in isolation, is a far cry from the systemic way in which patient safety has been promoted since 2000. So for all intents and purposes, I would argue, patient safety is new, not old. If medical harm has been recognized for thousands of years, then why has patient safety only become a major concern in the NHS since the millennium? And what I want to argue now is that there was a widespread culture of silence around patient harm in the NHS, which prevented this wider idea of patient safety from emerging. So to begin to explore this, it's worth ex explaining some of the dominant values and beliefs which dominated medicine and perhaps the single greatest value shaping the attitudes of doctors towards patient harm was clinical autonomy, which is the idea that doctors possess specially skills and knowledge which other groups such as patients, nurses and managers can't properly scrutinise. Since the 1858 Medical Act in Britain, doctors had won the right to regulate themselves in exchange for freedom in their decision making, their ability to control who became a doctor. Doctors implicitly promised to protect patients and to weed out colleagues who weren't fit to practice. This culture of autonomy and self-regulation was preserved when the NHS was formed in 1948 and had important consequences for the safety of patients. So for instance, it meant that only doctors were able to decide whether care was safe or unsafe. It was the legal, it was the standards of doctors who actually determined the legal standard of whether care could be considered negligence. Nurses, administrators and others working in the health service were expected to defer to doctors expertise and authority. And this meant that aspects of clinical decision making could go unchallenged. And a particularly powerful example of this was during the Bristol Heart Scandal in the 1990s when the chief executive of the Bristol Hospital Trust felt unable to question the performance of his heart surgeons, whose inaction had led to the deaths of dozens of babies. And this culture fed a kind of professional tribalism, which could lead to defensive attitudes. Doctors fiercely defended their autonomy and resisted interventions by managers or the state that they were thought to restrict their freedom. So, for instance, the medical profession opposed the extension of complaints procedures in hospitals. Many frontline doctors were reluctant to engage in formal processes of audits, which could have potentially revealed safety problems. 
unlike nurses, doctors rarely participated in the reporting of accidents, in part because they didn't want accident reports to come into the hands of patients or to be seen by lay managers who weren't clinical professionals. And owing to the strength of clinical autonomy in the NHS, especially before the 1980s, it simply wasn't possible to have this wider systemic approach to patient safety. Another reason for this culture of silence was that there was, and sometimes remains, of course, a deep-seated reluctance among doctors to acknowledge their fallibility and the reality of patient harm. In an environment where technical skill is so prized, mistakes or errors were often seen to be the responsibility of individual doctors and to strike at their heart of their professional identities. Prevailing ideas of clinical error assumed that given enough training or supervision, doctors wouldn't make mistakes. So therefore, many doctors were reluctant to admit mistakes to avoid being blamed. At the same time, studies showed that doctors were often willing to overlook routine errors by colleagues unless they were particularly serious or egregious. So punishment, for example, by striking off a colleague from the medical register was generally reserved only for the worst offenders and it was generally thought to be effective in removing individual bad apples. However, you know, professional collegiality and codes of conduct could also discourage doctors from raising concerns about their colleagues. So as late as 1979, for example, the doctor's regulator, the General Medical Council or GMC, advised doctors that deprecating the skills or knowledge of another doctor could be seen as grounds for serious professional misconduct. And it also advised doctors that errors in diagnosis and treatment were usually not matters for the GMC. Now, besides the consequences to doctors of disclosing error, one of the most important factors which prevented doctors from speaking up about errors or mistakes was their fear of being sued. And this ran really deep. In fact, one law, law lord, Denning, remarked in 1954 that for doctors being sued for, by a doctor was like falling onto a dagger. His professional reputation was as dear to him as his body, perhaps more so. So he's quoting Shakespeare there. In 1990, an anonymous doctor told the Guardian newspaper how patients trust their doctors. They have to because their lives are in our hands. Sometimes we have to tell little white lies just to preserve that trust. The lies are less blatant than they used to be because patients are more informed but it is still preferable to keep minor medical errors quiet to avoid damaging legal action. Now, what I would argue is doctors' fear of being sued is, is really curious given the hurdles faced, uh, patients faced in, in litigating, often simply due to, uh, to, to receive an explanation of the harm they'd suffered rather than any real desire for compensation. Litigation was costly, time consuming and emotionally exhausting. It wasn't uncommon for cases to last over a decade. If cases failed, claimants could be expected to pay the defence's costs, which could be completely ruinous. And in fact, it wasn't uncommon for claimants to actually sell their homes. Legal aid was very difficult to secure and hospitals could often refuse to hand over the patient's records, uh, such as accident reports and things like that. Uh, and doctors were unwilling to provide evidence that cast into doubt the competence of a colleague for the reasons I've uh, explained. The consequence of all of this was that harm to patients was generally kept under wraps, in-house, you know, something of concern for doctors only. Doctors actually had under their control a variety of ways to respond to patient harm, and I've, I've mentioned audits already. Uh, confidential, confidential surveys were often performed of deaths in particular specialties, and mortality and morbidity conferences could often be held by doctors following a serious complication or an unforeseen event. You'll notice, however, that these things were largely controlled by doctors. And at the level of NHS management, virtually nothing was known about the extent of adverse events in the NHS until the turn of the millennium. And that's striking. Increasingly, by the 1990s, regional managers in the NHS were informed of the most serious incidents and these were those which were thought likely to attract media attention, political attention, or those which were thought to invite litigation. Rather worryingly, however, little was done with this data to determine patterns in harm or areas that required improvement. 
And this speaks to how much of the NHS was engaged in reputation management rather than prioritising safety. So one striking example of this is that one NHS region's 24-hour hotline for reporting serious incidents, in fact, it was London, uh, the 24-hour hotline here was actually run by a PR company. Elsewhere, uh, you know, serious untoward incidents were often managed by media teams or political uh, liaison teams and so on. Now, so far I've, I've mainly mentioned doctors, but it's worth noting that the culture of silence extended to other professionals in the NHS too, such as nurses. So in nursing, the culture of subordinates to doctors, respect for hierarchy, and solidarity with one's colleagues could mean that instances of patient harm were suppressed, even deliberate acts of abuse and neglect. So from the late 60s, a string of official inquiries exposed appalling acts of abuse and neglect in long-stay institutions for the elderly, disabled and mentally ill. Official reports drew attention to widespread failures to act upon complaints by patients, the bullying and victimization of staff raising concerns, in the absence of formal systems of inspection and complaint handling, which could have potentially revealed service failures. And there were many reasons why such toxic cultures could develop in certain institutions. So many mental hospitals, for example, were remote on the outskirts of villages or in the middle of the countryside. In some institutions, staff actually lived on site. And this geographic isolation could breed a kind of insular thinking which meant that institutions were not exposed to outside ideas, perhaps more up-to-date thinking in psychiatry or ways of treating patients more compassionately. And this isolation was compounded by the fact that mental health was low prestige and hospitals could find it difficult to attract good personnel. So therefore, there was a kind of perverse link between the dilapidated state of many of these Victorian institutions and the toxic safety cultures that developed within many of them. So imagine being a patient in the 60s or 70s who experienced harm in hospital. Perhaps there was a medication error that extended your stay in hospital. Perhaps you were dropped from a hospital trolley or something was left in you during surgery. You actually had very few places to turn. In fact, the first port of call after an incident was usually for the patient to write to the consultant in charge of their case. But this could in fact be the consultant who had made the error during your care, or who oversaw another doctor who'd made the error. Unsurprisingly, patients often struggled to get an explanation or even a straightforward apology for what had happened, and medical defence organisations could tell doctors not to apologise, lest it be seen as a, an admission of liability. Now, you might be surprised to hear that because of opposition from doctors, it wasn't until 1985 that NHS hospitals were legally obliged to have a complaints procedure in place. It wasn't until 1988 that a complaints procedure was created that covered clinical aspects of care, such as one's medical treatment. So the Health Service Ombudsman, you might know it now as the, the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman, which acted as a source of appeal for complainants in the NHS, was actually barred from examining complaints relating to the exercise of clinical judgment until 1996. And this effectively excluded the vast majority of complaints which identified errors in diagnosis or treatment. From the 1960s onwards, patients' organisations were also established, which often helped patients to bring complaints against the NHS. Examples include the Patients' Association and Community Health Councils. However, these organisations had limited legal expertise to help patients with the most serious complaints, perhaps those which indicated negligence. So paradoxically, often the only way for patients to get answers following an episode of harm was to go to a solicitor. And this only reinforced this ingrained defensive culture of silence. Now, hopefully by this point, I've explained some of the reasons why patient safety is relatively new to the NHS. But this, of course, doesn't explain why patient safety came about. So in this final part, I want to discuss what happened in the 80s and 90s to put patient safety on the agenda. And the transition, I think, really began in the 1980s. The power and autonomy of doctors in the NHS began to wane around this time, in part due to the growing influence of managers. The NHS was exposed to a series of reforms by the Thatcher government, which were designed to make the NHS more cost-effective 
business-like and responsive to patients. And as part of this, non-clinically trained managers were appointed to the NHS and were increasingly uh, doctors were, were encouraged to take up management positions as well. So management thinking uh, increasingly dictated NHS priorities and how the NHS was run. Around the same time in the 1980s, the number of negligence claims made against the NHS increased massively, in part due to the increasing support for patients uh, for groups such as Action for Victims of Medical Accidents, or you might know them today as Action Against Medical Accidents. In some NHS regions, the number of uh, negligence claims increased fivefold over the 1980s. Uh, doctors' organizations like the BMA feared the import of an American style culture of litigation and argued that medical practice was becoming more defensive. The media at this time reported with horror the uh, injuries suffered by patients and their lengthy battles for compensation. In the same breath, however, they often expressed alarm at the vast sums awarded, especially for infant victims of brain damage. Reports of surgical blunders in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, they often use the word blunder, they suggest that the media and the public was becoming less trusting of doctors and more skeptical about medical progress. Now, prompted by the rising claims, research began to be conducted in the 1980s on the causes of medical accidents and their impacts on patients and clinicians. So, for instance, it was pointed out that mistakes could lead to secondary trauma in those clinicians that made them. Doctors reported feeling isolated from colleagues following a mistake and an energy sapping loss of cell confidence, which could make further mistakes more likely. As the level of awards to victims of medical negligence increased, so too did doctors' insurance against claims. Between 1986 and 1990 alone, the cost of doctors' subscriptions to their defence societies quadrupled, and this had a big effect on their pay packets, especially for junior doctors. In response, in 1990, the Conservative government introduced in NHS indemnity, and this placed the full onus for meeting the cost of claims onto the newly created NHS trusts. So no longer would doctors working exclusively within NHS hospitals have to take out their own insurance, as had been the case since the NHS was established. In 1948, doctors actually had demanded to take out their own insurance uh, because despite being salaried employees of the health service, it meant that they had the opportunity to defend their own reputations and to organize their own defense. Now, the consequences of NHS indemnity for patient safety were enormous, since hospitals now had a direct financial incentive to tackle the financial cost of claims, as well as the situations, the adverse events that gave rise to them. So hospitals began to employ dedicated risk managers and set up reporting systems and other mechanisms which are now integral to patient safety. So one of the most commonly used incident management systems in the NHS today is something called Datix, and this was created by a defence firm in the 1980s as a consequence of what I've just uh, mentioned. So the NHS as a whole now had a managerial interest in reducing clinical incidents. It was no longer purely a professional matter. By the 1990s, the medical profession in Britain was facing damaging questions about its ability to protect patients. Negligent doctors had long been tabloid fodder, and the sheer, num but the, the, the sheer number of scandals exposed by the media and patient groups in the 1990s meant that these questions became inescapable. Indeed, with every passing year, there seems to be some new medical scandal, each more shocking than the last. So, for example, there were several high profile cases of sexual assaults. There was the case of Rodney Ledwood, who styled himself as, quote, the fastest gynecologist in the southeast after allegedly performing seven hysterectomies in under four hours. He and he was struck off after a series of errors made during operations in Kent. There was the case of Richard Neal, another gynecologist who had been struck off the medical register in Canada following the deaths of two patients there yet had been seemingly free to join the medical register in Britain. And the conviction of the GP Harold Shipman for murdering 15 of his patients, and who, of course, was potentially responsible for hundreds more deaths, was perhaps the most shocking of all, calling into question the fundamental 
trusting relationship between doctors and patients. And as well as all, as, uh, all of these, there was the scandal revolving around the death rate for infants undergoing heart surgery at Bristol. Media attention focused on how long it took the death rate to be acted upon, the reluctance of managers to intervene, and how it took a whistleblower, the anaesthetist Steve Bolsing, to bring the case to public attention. In fact, Steve Bolson ultimately had to go to Australia to continue his practice. So all these cases were accompanied by frenzied campaigning and massive publicity by patients. Uh, and the regulation of British medicine as a result fell into crisis. It's against the backdrop of this crisis in medical regulation that we come back to this report, an organization with the memory published in 2000. And this report was commissioned by the Labour government, partly in response to lobbying by patient groups, such as the victims of Rodney Ledwood. And the report underlined how the NHS was appalling at learning from its mistakes. The same errors and the same tragedies kept being repeated again and again, and the systems in place to tackle them where they existed at all were poorly integrated and ineffective. Among the report's recommendations was the need for a new nationwide system for reporting adverse events, a programme of basic research into patient safety, and a way for lessons to be learned from adverse events and communi communicated throughout the entire NHS. And these functions were originally fulfilled by the National Patient Safety Agency, which was established in 2001, but as I mentioned before, eventually it was abolished. But in this way, the emergence of patient safety reflected a collective responsibility for the prevention of clinical harm. The whole system had an interest in preventing harm, not just clinicians. At the centre of the report's thinking was a new way of thinking about healthcare failures. Research by psychologists highlighted that most failures in healthcare were not caused directly by individuals. Rather, they were often the products of failures in systems and processes elsewhere in the organisation. And you might think this was rather commonsensical, but for the reasons I've described, in healthcare, error was often seen to be the responsibility of individuals. And this kind of systems thinking was commonplace in other industries, such as aviation, but had yet to be applied to healthcare. And uh, this is so, so this is called this image here is something called the Swiss cheese model by the British psychologist James Reason. I won't go into it here, but if anyone has questions about it in the questions and answers, I'll be happy to talk about it. But much of the subsequent focus on patient safety in the NHS has been to move away from an individualized notion of blame to consider the systems factors that give rise to healthcare failures. So patient safety, in a way, represented a systemic approach to patient harm in more ways than one. Not only was the system responsible for patient safety, but patient safety incidents were often seen to stem from system problems. So I want to end my talk with a, a brief reflection on the record of patient safety. Quite clearly, since 2000, there has been frenetic activity around patient safety in the NHS. But recurring scandals around the quality and safety of care in NHS hospitals, most recently maternity services in Kent and Nottingham, highlight that the NHS still has a long way to go to embody a genuine ethos of patient safety, rather than treating it as a kind of performative or box ticking exercise. So all too often the insidious culture of silence I've spoken about persists in many in institutions from mid-staffs to Morecambe Bay and East Kent, all too often the concerns of patients and staff have gone unheard, and it's required concerted action by the media, patient activists and campaign groups such as for the NHS, uh, NHS for action to be taken. Now, a lot of the focus on patient safety to date has been on improving systems and processes and creating new arrangements to encourage staff to prioritize safety. However, Changing underlying cultures in the NHS has proved a far more difficult prospect. While patient safety is certainly higher up the agenda than it was 20 years ago, many attitudes, values and behaviours among staff have proved resistant to change. And one of the main revelations of my research is just how slow cultural change is. It often took, it took many decades of a wall of silence to be dismantled just enough for patient safety to be put on the agenda in the first place. 
it goes without saying in a way that, you know, the NHS is also a truly vast and complex organisation. It's the largest employer in Britain and one of the largest employers in the world. In fact, only Walmart, the Chinese Red Army and the US Department of Defence are larger. The number of NHS employees is about the same size as the populations of Birmingham and Nottingham combined. That's just in England. And this gives an idea of the sheer size of the mission to get everyone in the NHS pulling in the same direction and putting safety at the heart of what the NHS does. And this could strike everyone, I'm afraid to say, as a rather pessimistic uh, note to end on. But what needs to be borne in mind is that patient safety started from almost nothing. All this activity around patient safety at a systems level has only really been going on for about 20 years. So patient safety is still very much in its youth and has a lot to learn. A lot of patient safety campaigners and advocates are discouraged by the glacial uh, place of pace of progress so far. But in the, in the quest to improve patient safety, there is clearly a lot of historical baggage to overcome. And hopefully it will not take another 75 years, the age of the NHS, for safety to become a reality for all NHS patients. Thanks everyone for your time and attention. Thanks, Chris. That was a, a really brilliant and rich paper. Um, so should we have five minutes now and come back at uh, uh, half past? Um, and then we'll we'll have a response from Sue and then we'll move into some discussion. Um, great. OK, we'll see people in five minutes.
Uh, cool. Okay. Well, before I um, introduce uh, Sue, I realize I'm, I'm slightly a minute ahead. I just want to remind people again, if you had questions, um, please do feel free to place them in the chat and I'll gather some of them up after Sue's responses and give you a chance maybe to speak to them if you'd like to, or if you're uh, happy to, you can um, raise your hand and um, uh, on using the sort of the raise hand function, and then we can kind of bring you in um, uh, that way instead. Um, so I think about half past. So uh, I'd just like to introduce everybody, um, to someone we're very lucky to have with us, um, uh, Sue Smith, who is a, a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences here at Exeter. She was originally a, a molecular geneticist, so um, uh, somewhat of a polymath here uh, amongst us, um, having studied at Edinburgh and Bristol universities, but then uh, sort of relinquished lab work for a role in um, a critical uh, safety, a safety critical industry and joined the NHS uh, in 2003, working in research and clinical effectiveness. And it was during this time that she got involved in uh, postgraduate teaching of healthcare staff, which led her to Exeter where she is continuing to teach and explore the leadership of patient safety and understanding how real clinical work gets done. So um, Sue, I'm gonna hand over to you to offer your sort of, your set of reflections and then maybe we'll give Chris just a sort of chance to respond to those before we move into a broader sort of question and discussion session. Sounds good. Okay, thank you, Martin. And thank you very much, Chris, for an absolutely fascinating talk. I really, really enjoyed it. And you covered so much territory. Um, and I think that reflects the broad um, expanse of this subject area in general, but it was a really, really fascinating talk. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and you covered it, you know, such a lot of territory, very engagingly. And I think um, the territory, the size of it reflects the sprawling nature of the subject matter in its own right it has kind of grown as health systems have grown and I guess that's what makes it quite tricky to get to grips with patient safety is it's it's an organic thing and it's evolved and there are all sorts of pressures um, sort of uh, structural sociological um, psychological all sorts of things are all in that mix um, and I wondered oh you made me reflect that when you talked about that common sense notion of patient safety that professionals worked with for many years um, as best they could, not knowing as much as professionals do these days. And I guess it was striking that perhaps the moment at where patient safety became defined um, was when that common sense approach was really felt not to be sufficient any longer. And, and that was a really interesting reflection for me and made me think about what we need to do in future to try and capitalize on that. Um, I think it was also striking leading on from that, that the management regulation and monitoring um, that has been put in place um, at the sort of dawning of patient safety as a proper sort of subject in its own right, um, automatically sets up a rather adversarial process in that your you one of the problems was that we had closed professional bodies and the adversarial monitoring and etc kind of leads it further into that entrenchment um, and I wondered as well whether that contributed I don't know if there are lots of thoughts you here but um, to that further entrenched by the fact that a lot of that stuff, especially from the sort of scientific management processes that came in in Mrs. Thatcher's era, were um, so embedded in sort of manufacturing management science where it's a production line and you're not producing cars here, you've got patients with infinite variabilities in their conditions and the way the disease is manifest in them, that I wonder if that was a challenge that automatically raised people's heckles. And, you know, we got into that terrible dichotomy between clinical, non-clinical, dark side, good side kind of situation in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and I wonder whether, um, I'm interested in your reflections, whether so much of the monitoring that's been put in place and the structures that we use to monitor and try to gauge how we're doing in patient safety are very structural, organizational, and actually the structures and those organizational silos are part of the problem and um, 
whether we need to sort of what we can do more fundamentally to work at that culture that real sort of massive issue that like you say that you were struck by how difficult that was to change um and I guess to, to sort of round up from my point of view um I wanted to know what you would think uh, you don't have to answer this now think about it and come back later on but um when we invite you back in 10 years time hopefully we'll meet you again before 10 years has passed but when you come back what would you like to be talking about as the history of patient safety from the mid 2020s to the mid 2030s um, and I think that sort of concludes what I'd like to say and open up the floor for everybody else but thank you very much it was really fascinating Uh, great, thank you for those um, those thoughts. So, Chris, did you want to come back on that? And then we've got a few questions coming in the chat. We can kind of go go to them afterwards. Yeah, thanks, Sue, for those uh, great comments. And I think, uh, in a way, I can take some of your your first two or three questions kind of together about the kind of decline of common sense in medicine, or perhaps clinical autonomy. Um, that one one word I didn't really mention. Uh, in uh, this presentation was quality uh, and how in 1980s and 1990s quality really came to the forefront of healthcare policy discourse in Britain. Um, but really what's what's interesting for me is safety wasn't really part of quality, uh, at least at first. It's only really around 2000 that this broader understanding of quality emerged uh, which placed safety at the forefront uh, or, you know, as a kind of core dimension of quality. And if you look at some of the earliest articulations of healthcare quality, safety often isn't, isn't part of it. So what I see is that patient safety was part of this wider bureaucratic managerial uh, and governance changes in medicine that kind of proceeded from the mid 1980s. So it is linked to things like the rise of clinical guidelines, the decline of autonomy, the rise of things like clinical audit and so on, evidence-based medicine. And there is this term, you know, scientific bureaucratic medicine. And you know, patient safety is very much part of this moment, but it's only really later on in the process that safety really was emphasized as opposed to healthcare quality. And indeed, patient safety researchers at the time, such as Charles Vincent, uh, who's now at Imperial College London, he really implored uh, quality researchers to and, and NHS uh, leaders as well to embrace this wider understanding of quality uh, that, that looks at safety because too often quality endeavors in the NHS could exclude safety. So if you look at clinical audit, for example, uh, often these focused on other things like clinical effectiveness or, uh, you know, professional advancement uh, and things like that. or so, you know, other measures of quality as opposed to looking at adverse events uh, and the all the focus on litigation that uh, occurred within the NHS, especially in the 1980s. Often this was on the kind of financial consequences of litigation rather than addressing the kind of underlying adverse events that gave rise to it. So clinical risk management in a part of healthcare quality as well. Um, but that didn't wasn't really um, manifested as patient safety until the turn of the millennium. Um, so yes, it's part of this larger kind of cultural transformation in healthcare, which healthcare quality is a part as well. Um, you mentioned about structural silos and how they were, how they are part of the, the problem. And yeah, that's that's one of the things that keeps coming up. Um, Part of the problem, of course, is that, you know, governments change and governments always want to put their kind of mark on healthcare policy by transforming the landscape of the NHS. And just in the last 20 years, there's been a number of massive sweeping kind of structural reforms of the NHS. Patient safety has continued to be a problem. And one of the dangers, of course, of, uh, you know, these institutional reforms is that they can take so long to bed in and it, they create a lot of disruption in the meanwhile. Um, so, you know, we're barely over the last NHS reforms and the, the new ones are probably going to be coming in. So there is this kind of uh, period of, of transition when things are often up in the air and often the, the kind of chopping and changing doesn't really address the underlying factors. I think it's a great shame in a way that the National Patient Safety Agency was abolished. It acted as a kind of singular centre for patient safety in the NHS since its establishment in 2001, but ultimately it was axed amid kind of cost cutting by the coalition government in 2012 and were also concerns about the MPSA's management. But in a way, it's become very fragmented and the, the kind of governance arrangements around patient safety in the NHS are truly 
labyrinthine. Like you, you, as a as a kind of layperson, you would struggle to understand, you know, the role of NHS resolution or the healthcare safety investigation branch. And all these things are splitting up and changing all the time. So there's the separation now of like maternity safety from other aspects of, of patient safety. Um, and this fragmentation is a, is a kind of huge problem. Uh, and I've, I've, I've come across other examples of siloing as well from a, a kind of earlier period. And I think one of the biggest examples of siloing is the, the kind of gap between patient safety and the health and safety of staff. And one thing which COVID has really kind of brought to the surface is just how the two are interlinked. And in fact, the, the, the theme of the World Patient Safety Day, I think it was the year before last, was on staff safety, because increasingly it is recognised in patient safety research that staff working conditions are patient safety conditions. But if you look at the kind of history of health and safety in hospitals as well, it's been totally siloed from patient safety. And I, in fact, I once interviewed a former director of patient safety in the NHS, and I, I, asked, her, I, I asked her, you know, is it common for a, for a health and safety officer in a hospital to sit alongside a patient safety officer to address kind of common risks that can address people? And, and, and the answer is no, often they, they're entirely different departments. I mean, maybe the board of hospitals may get reports from both of them, but these things are totally siloed. And it, so this siloing is a problem, but it comes on to, you know, the, the third question, which is what I would like to be to discuss in, you know, 10 years time. And I'm, it's hard not to be pessimistic, given the uh, you know investigations currently underway in maternity services and scandals continue to appear and toxic cultures continue to be unravelled. I mean, look what's going on in, in Birmingham, for example, at the moment. You know, it's hard to be optimistic that these toxic cultures are going to disappear. But I would really like to see staff safety and patient safety spoken about really in the same sentence. Uh, to some of the, these common risks you know, instances of bullying and victimization, how, how they influence reporting and attitudes and so on. I think they really need to be addressed um, together. And I think greater attention needs to be paid as well in terms of uh, the impacts of institutional reforms and the fragmentation of, of regulatory agencies. And I think it remains to be seen about the effectiveness, I think, of the healthcare safety investigations branch and things like that. Um, so let's let's see. I hope that goes some way to addressing some of these questions. Thank you. That was great. Brilliant. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. Viv. So we've got um, three three questions in the in the chat. I'll take them in turn. I'll I'll ask each person if they would like to to read their question or sort of repose it, or if they're happy for me to um, to read it out. So you can either use the chat to do that or, or whatnot. Um, the first is from Lou W. Would Would you like to um, speak to the question, or would you like me to to read it out on your behalf? Uh, ah, okay. Um, so uh, thank you, Lou. So Lewis said, um, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, do you feel that nurses and particularly the more recently qualified still feel that doctors can't be challenged? Uh, my experience seems to be that nurses who qualified over 20 years ago and some overseas nurses still have this ultra respectful attitude toward medical staff. Uh, newer staff seem to treat each other as more of a team. Um, does that does that ring true with some of the, the work that you've been doing, Chris? I, I think it varies, to be honest. I think that can persist in many institutions. I think one thing that healthcare scandals recently have shown is just how tribal groups of staff can be within hospitals. I mean, look at the you know, maternity services, for example, the fallout between, say, midwives and obstetricians and things like that. Um, I think that in very, very general terms, obviously, collaborative working, teamwork has been a kind of much more you know, central focus of clinical care. Uh, you know, since the millennium. Uh, and increasingly, I think, at least compared to the past, I think nurses can challenge doctors more than they used to. But I think tribalism persists all too much in many institutions, even among nurses themselves. I mean, it's not just not questioning doctors, but potentially you know, questioning their superiors as well, you know, sister, uh, you know, world sisters and so on, who perhaps have positions of authority. You know, these these uh, toxic cultures often stem from uh, professional tribalism falling out between different groups of staff within hospitals. But I think in, in very, very general terms, I think the situation has improved from where we were 30 years ago. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, we have a, a fellow LSHTM alum. Um, Judy, would you like to, <laughs> to, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, 
Thanks so much, Chris. That was su super interesting, uh, as expected. Um, and I guess you've touched on the answer to this question a bit in your response to Sue, but I, I just thought your argument about kind of how professional dominance had squashed attempts to take patient safety seriously were really convincing. But then when you kind of come to account for your second question, you know, well, why did it then have this takeoff? You're kind of left with a bit of a, well, I, is there an argument, at least in the UK, that that professional dominance has eroded? And one might kind of go, probably not. But whether that there's anything about the kind of comparison in the US where, and I don't know whether it's true that patient safety was perhaps a bit earlier to take off there. And that might have been some of the erosion of that clinical through HMOs and so on, there was a bit less control clinically, but just it'd be interesting to have your reflections on on, on that kind of asymmetry, I guess. Thanks, Julie. Great, great to see you. And, uh, you know, thanks for the uh, question uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are there are many symmetries between the U UK and US in terms of the factors that uh, underpinned patient safety. Well, so pa it's, it's a sort of briefly recap, I mean, Patient safety in the United States really kicked off following this report by the U.S. Institute of Medicine in 1999 called To Where Is Human. And the British report, an organization with a memory, appeared a year later. And although an issue, uh, sorry, To Where Is Human was eventually cited in an organization with a memory, what's really interesting is when you go through the kind of papers of the committee which wrote an organization with a memory, there wasn't much direct discussion between what was going on in the UK and what was going on in the US. Um, it, so patient safety in the UK really came about due to a kind of unique combination of circumstances in Britain, namely the kind of concern with litigation, uh, namely the kind of regulatory crisis, but also lobbying by patient groups as well, uh, which were really, really active. And of course, these things continue, uh, you know, the, were important in the US as well. So broadly, similar things happened. There were concerns about litigation. There was activism by patients. Um, but what's really interesting is what happened in the UK was, was due to a kind of unique set of circumstances that converged around 2000. There wasn't a direct dialogue between policymakers in the US and UK. One of the key links between them is this psychologist, James Reason, who attended some fairly influential conferences in the US in the 1990s. Uh, and who eventually was a member of the committee that I wrote. Uh, so in terms of the kind of intellectual basis of patient safety, in terms of systems thinking, there are much more direct links, but kind of culturally, um, these are, you know, a little more separate, I think. And I think a lot of the kind of um, the research so far has been rather US centric. It's focused on big developments in the US, but hasn't focused on specific developments in the NHS, which have prioritised patient safety. But certainly when it comes to things like the decline of clinical autonomy, I mean, this speaks to wider changes in healthcare cultures in, in biomedicine. This is not unique to Britain. Uh, certainly what you mentioned was very powerful in the US in terms of bureaucratic management. And that is one of the key kind of cultural changes that happens in healthcare in general. There's this questioning of clinical authority going all the way back to the 70s, but with the move to evidence-based medicine, bureaucratic management, and so on, the place of clinicians as the kind of like um, centerpiece of the healthcare system is challenged and the role of managers, the increasing role of managers is, is very important. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, a couple more um, uh, comments and questions in the chat. Um, uh, Amrit has said, uh, I agree poor conditions and other factors lead to low staff morale and increased patient safety risks. Um, Amrit, would you like to add anything to that or if you're happy to leave it there? Um, you can uh, just let us know in the in the chat. Maybe I'll move on to the, the 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 next question, and then if there's anything you'd like to sort of throw in, then please feel do. Um, we have a question here from Livy Joseph. Livy, would you like to um, speak to that uh, sort of in in person or uh, in voice? Or are you happy for me to read this out um, on your behalf? Ah, okay, <laughs> great. Um, so uh, Livy says, uh, uh, such an informative and interesting presentation. I'm very interested in stratified social systems, e.g. racism, patriarchy, ableism, and the influence from the inception of the NHS and the recruitment of staff from countries subject to British imperialism. For instance, uh, recruitment of workforce from former British colonies and the geographical migration of people to the UK changing the patient landscape. 
You spoke of the historical baggage of patient safety, key aspects of the history of medicine, medical procedures, and the inception of the NHS is often not spoken of. There is a lack of equity, equity which is evident in the absence or erasure of those that are disproportionately affected by patient and staff harm. In developing these safer systems and processes, how might uh, we be replicating or reinforcing harm if those that are marginalized are not part of the conversation? How does equity feature in patient safety? Uh, yeah, that's um, that's such an important question. I, I think that's possibly one for kind of patient safety researchers today rather than kind of historians, but certainly from, from my perspective, it has it has been I mean look at so our differences in mortality rates among uh, for infants um, delivered by black mothers for example uh, there are huge disparities which remain uh, in patient safety and I think are increasingly important um, but yeah these 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 disparities have have always existed but I think they're increasingly coming to attention uh, today. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Chris. And, and and Livia, if you'd like to um to, to follow up, please do use the use the, the chat. Um Su Suzanne, did you want to come in on that point? So, so did you want me to come in on that point specifically? Uh yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I was just if if that's okay, I was just gonna say that I think absolutely that um that the that equality I think is becoming a bigger and bigger issue in some of the more central bodies and like um, organizations such as the Health Foundation are really beginning to take that much, much more seriously, both in terms of the impact um, on patients uh, that are not treated equitably for whatever reason, and also looking at the impact, uh, and this very much um, obviously heralded from or hailed from uh, the COVID era, you know, the impact of staff um, and the lack of equality across different staffing groups uh, and the disproportionate bad effects on 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 different categories of staff so I think it's coming from two different directions now and and hopefully there's a sort of real head of steam there with that to realize that actually we can't carry on like that it's just unacceptable um, and and hopefully that's one thing that you'll be talking about in 10 years time Chris that how on earth did we ever put up with it for so long and we'll be thinking that's just outrageous um, and and we'll think we were highly primitive to ever, ever tolerated that kind of disparity in care um, for this length of time so but I think it is very much becoming more of the agenda the central sort of argument in in all sorts of circles now so I hope that's a little bit of optimism mm -hmm. And one thing I hope as well is now, you know, a staffing strategy is hopefully being put in place very, very slowly, I might add, and, you know, remarkable that it hasn't really been done so far. I'm hoping we will we will see some kind of uh, benefit from a staffing strategy, because I think this focus on staffing levels will, will obviously impact patient safety in so many areas. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I've I'll have a, I've got a follow up question to that, but I think I'll hold off on that so that we can bring on as many people as possible. Um, Jocelyn, um, did you did you want to um, ask your question directly? Or are you happy for me to um, to read it out on your behalf? Ah, okay. Um, so Jocelyn says, um, thank you for a great overview and excellent paper, Chris. Uh, again, to return to Sue's point, I'm thinking about where the NHS might be in 2033. What are your thoughts about the recurrent findings in national investigations that the voices of patients are persistently ignored by professionals and managers? Uh, yeah, I mean, this has been a repeated thing. I mean, what I find disturbing is you can go back to some of the earliest reports around healthcare failures in the NHS scandals. If you go back to the Ely scandal, in the late 60s around conditions in institutions for the intellectually disabled, the elderly and so on, you find many of the same patterns being repeated over and over and over again. And it's part of the reason why the NHS has lacked an institutional memory. The same problems have kept being repeated. And it speaks to these ingrained cultures, which I think systems and processes often don't get to. There's been so much focus on kind of superficial bureaucratic systems on things like reporting and so on, but relatively little attention on actually changing cultures. And that's where I think that mechanisms to bring staff together to more openly discuss their conditions like Schwartz rounds and so on are so incredibly important. 
because that's challenging some of these ingrained cultures of silence uh, which I've mentioned uh, and the focus should increasingly be on I think culture rather than systems and processes but you know patient safety researchers might be in a better uh, place to 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 answer that um so yeah I'm I'm I, I am hoping but I mean what do you think the, it's only really relatively recently that mechanisms such as freedom to speak up guardians have been brought in and just to kind of recap these have been brought in following a report by Sir Robert Francis in 2015. Uh, and these are supposedly staff within NHS trusts who ask, uh, uh, kind of act for ad, uh, as advocates for staff who can be approached to address concerns. But ultimately, of course, they are employed by, you know, the NHS trust, you know, they are creatures of management in some degree. So it remains to be seen just how effective systems like freedom to speak up guardians will be. And, it, you know, certainly, you know, it, the evidence so far seems to be, be a bit discouraging. But I think one of the big outcomes of my research is, in a way, patient safety and development of patient safety have been influenced by things which are a bit indirect. So, you know, the decline of clinical autonomy has promoted patient safety. And yet that hasn't been a kind of like deliberate thing, in a sense. Um, so I, I think it will, will take... Um, it will take wider changes, I think, in British culture and British society for patient safety to be at the, the kind of forefront. Great, thanks, Chris. I have a, I've got a question myself, um, but I'm going to hold off for a second, give people one last chance to maybe ask their own questions. And whilst I just say that um, we are due to finish at three, um, but we might have a a bit of a, a, a you know a horrendous term a raggedy end to this um so people do um sort of drift away as, as and when um before you do again i'd just like to thank uh, um our captioner maria for um doing a brilliant job with uh, the live captions and to to let people know a recording of this uh, with those captions will be going up uh, on the the welcome center um youtube channel and just encourage people again um to to take a look at the the events page on the um on the Welcome Centre site, and it would be great to see you at sort of uh, uh, future events. Um, uh, and thank you for your time. Um, so I, I just wanted to sort of, I guess, pick up. I've got loads of questions, and, and I think um, I might have to email some of them to you, Chris, because you know, I don't want to uh, bore people with, uh, with them. But I suppose just picking up on um, on the sort of the question of um, of equity and um, and Libby's point about the extent to which. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of history of patient safety might be a white history in a way um, that, you know, of, of, of usually in sort of policy terms, the kind of the, the, the universal patient is often considered to be the kind of white British patient, probably middle class, um, most likely to be a kind of, uh, you know, a, a fluent, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Okay, yeah, I'll, uh, there's another question that's popped up. Um, uh, whereas, and I was kind of wondering about um, so that whether that's kind of your impression that actually the sort of the, the patient, the imagined patient in patient safety is again that kind of figure. Um, but then also thinking about the, the the sort of embodied subject, if you like, of the people that have tried to bring patient safety onto the agenda. So obviously, you know, you mentioned that often these are coming from um, Sort of patient, well, what we might have called patient consumer groups, I suppose, but patient patient lobbying groups and about the sort of demographics there, and also where the sort of big scandals were, the sort of the types of patient, you know, who was it that really generated the sort of massive concern around the sort of in the nineties and the sort of early two thousands that really pushed this onto the agenda. Yeah, um, you know, I'm thinking in terms of again those sort of those, those characteristics of of age, class, race, and the kind of intersections of um, of those of those characteristics so would you be able to speak to that um as well yeah these are really important questions i hope i kind of do justice to it and i i think yes i think i think the history of patient safety is, is quite a white history i mean certainly the kind of intellectual histories which have been written on the kind of main movers in patient safety research is generally quite quite white um but equally you know in terms of uh campaigning in the past these have often been from you know, um, you know, white British, largely white British uh, groups. I think increasingly, um, you know, as disparities in healthcare become increasingly important, I think it's becoming more diverse uh, today. Uh, but certainly, um, 
how things have how things have changed so you know back in the 1960s a lot of the focus was on conditions in institutions as i mentioned for the elderly and intellectually disabled and the campaigning was largely around this uh, so some of the kind of initial big safety scandals within british hospitals largely revolved around these isolated institutions as i mentioned often the, on the outskirts of of towns and villages and so on um, and often these things have, have continued if you look at kind of this scandal at Winston, Win, uh, Winterbourne View only a few years ago these kind of cultures which I mentioned in these institutions can can persist as well uh, by the 1990s there was a kind of more a concern with clinical safety per se uh, so uh, there we have kind of the Bristol Heart scandal comes to mind there was the scandal around cervical smears in Kent and Canterbury. So there was a number of these scandals, but the sort of general movement is from a concern with um, concern around uh, the intellectually disabled and institutions of the elderly back in the 60s and 70s to a more general concern with clinical safety in the 80s and 90s. If you look at mid staffs, once again, that was a, a, often a con general concern around the, the kind of standards of care in this hospital. Um, Clinical safety was a major feature there, but arguably more so it was on the general standards of care, you know, particularly nursing care. And now, of course, a lot of the focus is on maternity safety, which I find really, really interesting. So there's been, the, that, that's the kind of general kind of movement I've been seeing. And a lot of the campaigning has been rather specific ar around this. So uh, often patient activist groups have, you know, um, kind of revolved around particular NHS trusts, particularly groups of patients who have been affected. Certainly groups like Cure the NHS have had a broader remit, although Cure the NHS did have a, uh, uh, you know, their constituency, if you like, was largely around uh, Stafford, but equally they had, you know, kind of splinter groups set up elsewhere as well. Um, so there hasn't really been Often we often there's this tendency to speak of the patient safety movement as quite a monolithic thing, where actually it's been a, usually a variety of different groups, uh, often with different aims, different purposes, different notions of responsibility and blame and things like that. There's there's not been a single coherent patient safety movement, rather a lot of different groups campaigning for different purposes and often being being at odds with each other. And a, a great example of that is you know um, there are groups who are more likely to work. We're looking at the solution for patient safety, more likely to work with managers and leaders in the NHS and other groups, you know, are more likely to blame NHS managers and, and leaders and don't want to work with them at all. And there's, there's a lot of um, disagreement often in that area. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, one last question and another comment, maybe before um, uh, I, I read those. I just want to say thanks again for a brilliant presentation. Maybe we could just give one last but sort of round of applause as as people um, disappear, and then I'll and then I'll ask those and put those to you. So, um, uh, thank you, uh, thanks, Chris. It's been uh, uh, it's been great. Um, so yes, um, so a comment from Jocelyn just to follow up on what you're saying. Um, I agree that culture is at the root of the problems in relation to patient voice. I'm not hopeful about the freedom to speak up guardians. They are one of many top-down, well-intentioned initiatives that are under-resourced and do not generally get traction in NHS trusts. Very pleased to hear you support the Swatch rounds and the links you made between rounds and patient safety as they previously led the Point of Care Foundation, which brought the rounds to the UK. Mm -hmm. They are an example of an initiative which is more bottom up than top down. And yeah. um, maybe that would be someone you could you could follow up. I, I I would love to. And I think, yeah, I think that was the point I was trying to make, probably not so eloquently, that a lot of the initiatives so far have been imposed from above, shall we say. Um, and I think a lot of the answers to patient safety come from these more grassroots. Uh, grassroots uh, initiatives mm. and a kind of interesting parallel i guess with patient mm. consumerism i suppose with, with, with mm. Alex, uh, more and stuff. um and and so finally last question um uh, larry lock um has said uh, great presentation thank you i'm curious about the need um for doctors uh, doctors felt to contract for personal insurance for malfeasance despite being employees of the nhs in most corporate contexts, if an agent of the organization mistreats someone, the victim wants to sue the organization rather than the agent to get access to the organization's deep pocket. Was it the autonomy doctors experienced that made them feel vulnerable and in need of insuring? Was it a lack of support for doctors on the part of the NHS? Or was it a perception that doctors themselves represented deep pockets? So doctors themselves wanted to take out their own insurance. 
they feared that if health boards, so this is going back to, you know, the organization of the NHS in the late 40s and 50s, but doctors back then feared that if hospitals assumed full responsibility for defending against claims, the financial burden that is, there was an incentive to kind of settle claims early rather than to fight them. And for doctors, really what was on the line was their professional reputations. They wanted to protect that. And, you know, the professional reputations were damaged by litigation. So they wanted a chance to defend themselves. So that's why they opted to, to continue taking out their own defence. And these defence societies had existed since the 19th century. And they wanted to maintain paying subscriptions to these due to that reason. Uh, so, and what happened is, you know, the ruling in the 1950s was that hospitals were vicariously liable for the acts and omissions of their doctors. Uh, but they they basically uh, organized their defense together. So doctors, doctors took out their own insurance, but the, uh, the, the defense of the hospital and the uh, defense of the doctor would, would kind of um, speak to each other, put it that way. Great. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, I think it's only right that we give you <laughs> a break there and, a, and, a, and an end there. So um, I think all that's left is to say uh, thanks to Chris and to Sue and for Maria and thank you everybody else um, for coming and sharing your time and thoughts. Um, uh, and we, we look forward to seeing you at sort of um, at future events. But um, yeah, I think we can round that up there. So, um, so thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.